Hey friends, welcome back to Channeling Chinez and welcome to the final installment of the Degrassi Couple Soul Connections Breakdown. In the last two podcast episodes, we looked at all of the karmic connections. So we are finally getting into soulmate and twin flame territory. We've raised our vibration, thankfully. So before we get into that, please don't forget to subscribe to this channel. Consider liking this video or leaving a comment as it helps this channel grow. You can also connect with me at Official Chinez on Instagram and TikTok. You can book a personal reading for yourself, especially if you want to look into your own healing or relationships. Those are areas that I specialize in. Um, and you can find the link to do that in the description box below. And you can also browse my products as well. Before we get into this next video, please go ahead and check out this message. Please also be reminded that any celebrities or public figures used in the depiction of these concepts are for entertainment purposes only. Please help me in keeping everyone safe online as we use these videos to heal and build our individual and collective consciousness. As we jump into these last couples, it's important to note what a soulmate actually is and that you can have different kinds of soulmates typically people assume that soulmates are the definition of somebody's one true love or magical other person and a lot of that can be true but in the simplest definition they are a soul vibration who is very similar to our own and very closely linked to us in our cosmic family, if that makes sense. And soulmate relationships are those that are salient, that stick with us over a long period of time. These are connections where you can have friendships or family relationships or romantic relationships with deep, strong bonds that even last through different lifetimes and life paths and take on different forms as individuals grow and change. So there are two categories of soulmates. One is the healing soulmate. These are the relationships where each individual is challenged in deep soul lesson areas in order to grow and elevate to the next level. In these connections, these individuals can stay together permanently. And I say that with air quotes because, um, you know, what is really like permanent? They can stay together for a particular lifetime or they can choose to separate. Either way, these relationships are put into people's pathways to really grow them. It's where they experience their biggest evolution and leaps spiritually as a result of being in this connection and then the second type of soulmates are companion soulmates or classic soulmates i use the word classic because these are the kind of soulmates that people think of when they think of soulmate they think of a relationship where there are no issues between you and that other person and a lot of times in these companion soulmate relationships, that is true. You may not have issues between the two of you, but you oftentimes have issues from the outside world or issues within your own individual paths that end up challenging the two of you and supporting each other in that relationship. But the issue isn't a core issue between the two of you. So that is important to note as we go into this soulmate category because we are going to be breaking down healing soulmates and classic soulmates. First up on the healing soulmate list, we have Paige and Spinner. What's interesting is Spinner was originally interested in Terry and Paige did all of this shysty work behind the scenes so that Terry could embarrass herself because Paige felt entitled to having a boyfriend before Terry. Why? Because Paige felt entitled to everything, right? But the connection that she ended up having with Spinner is one of those deep soul connections where the two of them grew a lot from being in this relationship. Spinner had to support her through her case and trial and through 
her unfortunate assault, um, Paige really pushed Spinner to grow up, pushed him to stop being juvenile, pushed him to start to work and earn money, um, to really become his own man and his own person because she felt like any person who was standing beside her should be her equal. And she saw Spinner that way, even when he didn't see himself that way. But it's definitely one of those relationships where these two individuals could grow up and be adults and then eventually just be really great friends because they have such a deep soul connection and a value for the other person. Paige and Spinner also represent the kind of connection that individuals can grow out of, where one person may be moving spiritually or internally at a faster rate than the other person. We see that with Paige developing faster, expanding more as a person, learning more about herself and sort of separating from Spinner who was clinging to his limitations and his small worldview. Um, but you can also have these relationships where both individuals grow together. But in this instance, Paige and Spinner ultimately separate. The next connection on this Healing Soulmates list is Ellie and Sean. This was a really warm connection initially. You could tell that the two of them really, really fit well together. But what's interesting is once they go through living together, um, Sean supporting Ellie through her recovery and Ellie being, you know, a safe home and warm landing place for Sean. When Sean ends up moving away after the tragedy that happened at Degrassi, he comes back, but he doesn't come back for Ellie. And a lot of people were always confused by that because it seemed like Sean and Ellie had a stronger connection or they had a better relationship. And in many respects, they had a more balanced relationship, right? But Sean, who's gonna appear later on in this video, has a higher timeline and he is slated to do a different kind of growth. And so his soulmate connection with Ellie was to ultimately elevate his growth and elevate him in order to be able to go back and heal his past childhood trauma. Whereas for Ellie, it basically triggered her to have to do the same thing once he moved out she had to reconcile the relationship with her mother or continue to struggle to pay rent but the two of them sort of served to support each other but also trigger each other to those levels of growth the next relationship on the healing soulmate list is jay and alex this one is kind of more cut and dry they were both kind of in a low vibrational place together and so they fit because of those reasons but alex was living inauthentically and needed to see that through her relationship with jay and jay was living completely unattached and unaware of his behavior and how his behaviors impacted other people um which is another character trope that we see a lot with degrassi characters especially the masculine characters who have these personas of being very reckless or they get like the bad guy rap. Jay had to totally be taken down with this ego that he sort of touted around because it was a false perception of who he was as well. Um, he wasn't this person who was constantly disconnected from hurting other people. He definitely had a low level of empathy for others and that's something in his personality that was later addressed, but it wasn't non-existent empathy. Um, him and Alex both were able to sort of dissociate from their real issues by being in a relationship with each other. And then once the tragedy happened with Rick at the school, it was as if Alex woke up and realized, okay, I'm going the wrong way. And it has a lot to do with this connection with Jay and I'm not living in my authentic self either. So I do feel like the two of them, however, have this sort of soulmate quality because there is an ease when it comes to their connection because they both sort of come from a similar walk in life or are cut from a similar cloth. 
And you can tell that they did enjoy their relationship with each other while they were in it. But it's also one of those relationships where Jay actually cared about Alex, despite the fact that he couldn't be with her anymore. He still felt a connection to her. In my opinion, it was truly her connection to her soul that still resonated for Jay with Alex. And Alex, at the same time, didn't necessarily want to fully discard Jay. She was tired of him trying to make their relationship happen, but she also knew that he was her friend. So they had that kind of soulmate relationship, healing soulmate relationship, where they could also be friends after the demise of the relationship and after both of them have grown in separate ways. The next relationship that we have on the list is Holly J and Declan. These two are another soulmate connection where... They genuinely did fall in love with each other and it was truly life's circumstances that pulled them apart. But at the end of the day, it's also those life circumstances that highlighted the growth areas that they both needed to address. Holly J really had the Paige um, syndrome where she was this type A girl who had a very strict set trajectory of what she thought her life should be like and who she thought she should be rubbing elbows with. It needed to be people from Declan's world because that's where she fit in and needed to realize that she had to build her own, I guess for lack of a better way of saying, her own kingdom, her own dynasty on her own and that she couldn't, well, she could have actually, but that it might not have been for her highest growth for her to just attach herself to Declan because that means that you're also allowing that person to have control over you and what you can and cannot do. Declan had to realize that there's no amount of money that can control a strong-willed, powerful woman. And even though that's what he might see in his household between his parents, that may not be what's healthy. And Declan had a really hard time accepting that the way that he was raised may not have been right or that his parents were wrong or that he could disagree with them or that he could have a difference of opinion of how he's supposed to lead his life. He felt very much indoctrinated into this sort of upper class lifestyle and felt that he had to be that at all times. And that means that money should buy prop money should buy things and should be able to dismiss problems. And it wasn't able to do so in his relationship with Holly J. And it wasn't able to do so in his connection with his sister when it comes to his relationship with Holly J. There weren't there weren't enough places that he could send Fiona in order for her to get the message that she was acting inappropriately and that the two of them were way too enmeshed and that that was impacting his relationships romantically with other people. So Holly J and Declan taught each other deep valuable lessons and they're definitely one of those soulmate connections where they'll never forget each other and one of the scenes that always sticks out to me for Holly J is when she's finally in the hospital after getting her kidney transplant and there is a flower delivery there from Declan and it's just one of those things that you could actually see them getting back together in the future if they both don't marry different people but that they'll always be special to each other in each other's lives. When talking about Holly J and Declan I would be remiss if I didn't bring up the incident that happened when Declan came to visit for the high school theater awards. I think this incident is significant not only because of the nature of it, but because of the two people involved and because we're talking about healing soulmates. And I think sometimes people underestimate just how much consent particularly in situations where you've had a romantic relationship with this person or at the very least know the person and what it means to get consent in those situations is oftentimes blurred between people and it happens way more often than it should and I think that this example was important to show between Holly J and Declan. Um, I definitely felt for Holly J in this scenario because I can understand and relate to the confusion about um, not knowing whether or not you really want it to participate in something, but also knowing that you really, truly, deeply love that person. And I also think that this was a deep soul lesson for Declan as well. 
um, for both of them for consent, but particularly for Declan, because this really harkens back to him needing to unpack and unlearn a lot of the entitled energy that he has inherited and internalized along his generational line and how that impacts his decision making, even with people who he knows love him or he may know may want a deeper relationship with him, but that doesn't negate the necessity and the requirement for consent on both sides. The next relationship on this list is Riley and Zane. Riley and Zane taught each other very, very deep lessons. Of course, Zane showed Riley the impacts of his homophobia, um, of his internalized hatred for himself, um, and from his inability to be authentic with his family members. Um, but at the same time, Zane showed Riley how to have boundaries and how to you can leave space for someone to grow but you don't have to do that at the expense of your own value or that person being appreciative and honoring of you you don't have to be somebody's dirty little secret um, in order to help them and support them in their growth because that's not a self-loving act so both of them had to learn elements of self-love through each other but from two completely different lenses the next relationship one of my favorite relationships of all time drew and bianca absolutely soulmates i mean they get together in a little bit of a shady way obviously drew is a notorious serial cheater and so he cheated with ali cheated with bianca on ali um and then eventually ends up in this relationship with Bianca, but they were actually very lovely. Like <laughs> they were a very cute relationship. Bianca genuinely loved Drew for who Drew was. She had no desire to change Drew. She wanted to support him as best as she could, but then she also wanted to grow and he did give her that sense of family and stability that she didn't have in her own home. And at the same time with Bianca, that relationship is what Drew needed to push him to be more vocal in his relationship with his mother because straight up, Audra, mad toxic. Like she's the boy mom who thinks that her son is her man because Audra was very rude to every girl Drew ever looked at. He couldn't breathe in a girl's direction without Audra being rude. She was the rudest to Allie and Allie was arguably the best girlfriend he ever had. He literally cheats on Allie and Audra blames Allie talking about some, what did you do to my son? What, what? She was very toxic, very toxic boy mom. And Bianca was the only relationship that Drew was really going to put his foot down. Bianca was too fine. You was not going to take Bianca from Drew. Not a gang member, not an Audra, not his friends, nobody. And the only thing that really ended up separating them was that he couldn't get over what happened. He couldn't stop blaming Bianca for getting beat down, for getting into the issues with the gang in the first place for catching a charge on her behalf but they had this sort of undying connection and passion for each other and so we saw that play out but then we also saw Bianca really grow and blossom and this is sort of what makes this a healing soulmate connection because as I said in the in some previous pairings you could have an individual in the connection who does grow at a faster rate than the other person, which we see here go off to college and do that and ultimately come back and give him the turkey dump. But her ending the relationship with Drew was for both of their highest goods. It's so that they both could grow and expand and not feel like they had to hold on to these older versions of themselves in order to maintain this connection. It's definitely one of those relationships where I'm not sure if they could be friends because I do feel like Drew would always be in love with Bianca, so it would be hard to be her friend, but it would definitely be a relationship that they could never ever forget. It's like when that person's birthday comes up and you always remember it's their birthday. That's Drew and Bianca. The next relationship on the healing soulmates list is Ali and Dallas. This is also one of my favorite Degrassi relationships because it was a healing experience for 
both parties. Ali had just come out of that abusive relationship with Leo. And even before that, she was in this relationship with Dave that, and now that I come to think about it, I don't even have Ali and Dave on this list. <laughs> now that I come to think about it, if I did though, if I did put Ali and Dave on this list, it would have been Karmic Lesson. That's what it would have been. Um, not Soul Tie, it would have been Karmic Lesson. Um, because Dave really needed to, he was one of those male characters that put the female character on the pedestal without knowing who she was, giving very much Owen energy. And then when he found out who she was, he was disappointed. And then Allie was sort of in this relationship with Dave because she finally picked the nice guy. She stopped chasing the Johnnies and the Drews and picked the nice guy. And she was, that was supposed to be the happily ever after, right? But sometimes the nice guy that's all he is. It's just a nice guy. There's really nothing else there. And the relationship was not compelling enough for her to look away from her craft, her work as a scientist, and what she was trying to build for herself. So moving forward, when we look at her relationship with Dallas, she's then coming off of this abusive relationship with Leo. And Dallas is actually trying to step out and date after having a child very young and making very poor decisions in love. So you can see they're both coming into the situation having made some quote unquote mistakes from their past and they both are looking for a place where they can feel safe. And Dallas does a beautiful job of making Allie feel safe by defending her against Leo and allowing her to get her closure while also giving her space until she was ready to be in a relationship and then at the same time Ali because she had been with so many different partners and she had been with imperfect partners she knew how to set the boundary for Dallas that listen you need to tell me the truth I don't need to find out from everybody else that you have a child but also to accept the fact that people are flawed that they may not be all of the perfect kind of like how she built up drew to be this perfect person and leo to be this perfect person she was able to accept the flaws and in individuals but not to a fault not to a point where it was holding her back the next relationship on this list is claire and eli obviously claire and eli are soulmates but they teach each other very deep soul lessons the relationship between claire and eli triggers his mental health diagnosis um it is something that challenges claire's spiritual faith as she watches her parents go through a divorce and eli is giving her a different perspective um, of how to look at things than she was used to in her faith-based christian background then they break up and they're challenged within that breakup. The whole fits thing happens, etc. Um, then they get back together and they're trying to balance their relationship and it's finally at a good place. And then things start coming out them from the outside. Claire goes through that thing with her mentor. Eli is trying to put on his play with Becky. Becky's giving him issues. And so it's like they go through all of these high pressure growth areas within their own lives. But they're one of those connections where they both are sort of pacing similarly with their growth like it might have seemed like Eli was making leaps and bounds and then Claire was making leaps and bounds but it was really both happening simultaneously and they were sort of able to do their best at their young age to support each other through those growths ultimately they made their mistakes Eli cheated when he got to college and that caused the breakup they did the whole pregnancy thing I'm not going into that because it was so unnecessary but it was definitely another hard experience between her and Eli to have to deal with that loss and then ultimately Claire realized that she needed to forge her own path and forge her own future um, and Eli had to accept that she's allowed to grow and she's allowed to experience in the same way that she let him experience adulthood and so it's the kind of healing relationship where I do feel like they could continue to heal um, in connection and separately, but could ultimately stand the test of time. Very few relationships can do that on a soulmate level, but I feel like Claire and Eli are the main ones who have that going for them. The next relationship on the healing soulmate list is Jenna and Casey. 
I mean, it kind of goes without saying the deep lessons that they learned with each other. They brought life into the world and then they had to give that child up for an adoption. They were both from broken homes. Um, they were both uh, sort of like overlooked in some ways in school because they were from broken homes. Jenna sort of like had her ability to stand out through music, but Casey was also very intelligent and very smart, but they were susceptible to a lot of things because of their upbringing. Casey went through a lot and Jenna, Jenna's biggest issue is that she was manipulative and her manipulation in order to keep Casey in her good graces is what ends up <laughs> getting her into the situation where she finds herself pregnant and then completely overlooks that until they don't have a choice but to go through with the pregnancy because she chose to be in denial. Casey and Jenna both struggle with denial of certain situations and it might have to do with their upbringing and the fact that they were forced into situations because of their parents where they had to survive, which made them sort of deny the reality of feeling abandoned by your parents or your parent going to jail or whatever the case may be. And so they were very much both wounded and those wounds fit together like a glove. They ended up making a child and ultimately the biggest lesson in healing for the two of them was having to give that child up and actually work on themselves as individuals. The next healing soulmates on this list is Becky and Adam. Becky and Adam actually, I, I didn't dislike this relationship between Becky and Adam. I think that Becky is just not one of my favorite characters, even though I enjoyed watching her character come into reality. Not that it's enjoyable to see someone be taken down a peg, but I enjoyed watching Becky find her voice, even if she wasn't one of my favorite characters, because she was very much silenced in her household. Um, and her brother was put up on a pedestal for absolutely no reason. And I felt proud of Becky when she found her voice within her family. But Adam and her relationship with Adam had a lot to do with her being able to approach that healing and successfully move through that healing because Adam challenged not only her perception of herself and who she thought she had to be within the eyes of her family, um, but also her perception of other people because she had very strict and at times, I don't know if I can say the word bigoted <laughs> on YouTube <laughs> beliefs um, that were completely challenged when she realized that she had actual feelings for Adam, the trans guy on the show. And Adam continued to struggle with worthiness and being wanted and being seen as a masculine in a relationship with a feminine character and wanting that feminine character to see him as a masculine. So this is why their relationship with Becky was so pivotal because out of all people, the super faith-based girl who has very um, narrow beliefs about gender, to see Adam as a true masculine was a meaningful experience for Adam, even though ultimately he needed to see those things within himself. The next relationship on the healing soulmates list is Maya and Zig. And I almost didn't put Maya and Zig on this list. I almost put them on the twin flame list because they initially really fall for each other. And then Zig runs away from the connection to go and be with Tori because he had no earthly reason to not be with Tori, which didn't make any sense. And Maya sort of allowed that to happen. What, because there's nothing that she could have done about it, right? But why I didn't put them on this list is because Maya didn't chase Zig. Whereas in most twin flame relationships, when the masculine counterpart pulls away, initially the feminine will chase after them and then you get this runner chaser dynamic. Maya let it go. Um, but her relationship with Zig had such a deeper soul connection that he was always coming back around when it came to her next growth areas or next expansion in her life. Like 
when you think about them coming together post cam and then going through another separation because then Maya chooses to start dating Miles and then Zig is left to grow on his own and it's sort of like this back and forth but what's really happening is they sort of come together to trigger each other and then they go off and learn these separate lessons. That's the element that's giving it twin flame but not so much so in this case it's more so of just like soulmates that mimic those behaviors because Maya and Zig are not the exact same soul vibration. They're two different souls. They're two different people. They just have this sort of kindred spirit deep bond. And when we get to the twin flame category, you'll see how twin flames mirror each other um, in being the same soul vibration. And the last relationship on the healing soulmates list is Miles and Tristan. I actually didn't dislike this relationship as much as I do not like Tristan as a person. Um, I do feel like they were soulmates in the sense that they had a very easy, magnetic, close bond. And they also had a lot of healing to do back and forth. Tristan had to not only realize his self-worth, you don't have to um, put up with the way that Miles treats you in order to keep a man. And Miles had to sort of reconcile with you know, his own desires and then ultimately how he treated people because of the things that were happening to him in his life, like his parents and the way his father was treating him, he would then project that and take that out on Tristan. They both had to sort of learn how they projected their inner issues into the relationship. If Tristan didn't feel good enough and he would have to overcompensate in order to win Miles back. When Miles felt like he was being you know, harmed or put down by his father, he had to find a way to harm or put down Tristan or make Tristan feel beneath him. Ultimately, the two of them ended up becoming more balanced. Then Tristan has his traumatic accident and Miles then pivots into bonding with people over that trauma or through that trauma. So ultimately, when the two of them break up at the end of next class, it is for their highest good for the two of them to grow separately and when healing soulmates break up it's typically for the highest good of both parties moving along to classic soulmates this is probably going to be the easiest quickest category because classic soulmates are just good together they're just good and the issues in their relationship are typically external to them or it's like one person doesn't necessarily realize the value of the connection at first and then they eventually come to that realization and then it becomes very balanced so i'm going to almost rapid fire go through these individuals on this list so that we can move on to our final category which is twin flames so the following couples are classic soulmates in degrassi and they include Emma and Spinner. I mean, these two come together when Emma is very clear about who she is and Spinner is very clear about who he is. They both realize they're never going to be any bigger than Degrassi and they decide to put down roots and it just makes sense. Jimmy and Ellie, they also had a really amazing soft bond. It's just unfortunate that Ellie dismisses it like I said some of these relationships that happens where one person will sort of dismiss the value of it sometimes it ends up being too late like it does in this situation um and other times the couples end up saving that and being able to have this great relationship after one of them sort of dismissed the relationship as valuable Jimmy and Ellie were really able to support each other artistically and conversationally like they had one of the most easiest connections if only Ellie appreciated what she had. Next on the list we have Manny and Jay. They have one of the most surprisingly um, cohesive balanced relationships where Manny at the end of the day she just needed a rider. She needed somebody who was going to ride for her and Jay was that guy and Jay needed to be with a feminine that would put him in his place and humble him because she knows she's that girl and that's what he ultimately ended up getting in Manny. Their issues were outside of them family, college, life, like making choices, 
her going to move to Hollywood, him staying behind and what that was going to mean for their connection. Manny and Jay just have one of my favorite Degrassi relationships because it's just easy. Sav and Holly J, they are next on the classic soulmates list. These are two individuals who didn't really pay each other as much mind in the beginning of the series. Holly J thought Sav was weird because he liked stickers. Sav thought Holly J was scary. As the two of them grow in separate relationships, by the time they get to their senior year, they're very equal. They're standing eye to eye and they're able to really be warm and support each other. I mean, at the end of the day, their relationship got stale for Holly J and that can happen, but it wasn't because of anything that either one did wrong. It was just one of those relationships that sort of ran its course. Next on the classic soulmates, we have Marisol and Mo. Marisol didn't necessarily appreciate Mo initially, but she came to the realization that they were such a good match. We also have that connection with Jenna and Connor, where Connor was definitely slept on until he had his little glow up and Jenna realized how wonderful he was. And then our last classic soulmate relationship is with Tiny and Shay. They had, I love Tiny and Shay. Honestly, Tiny and Shay are, is probably one of my favorite relationships because I could see it in real life. I could see the two of them being into each other in real life and they're both so smart but then have separate strengths where Tiny is really like talented and can dance and Shay is this athlete and you could actually see them like growing and staying together for a long time because they have so much in common and it's just so easy. And finally, we are finally here to the twin flame category. Oh my gosh, a lot of people don't understand what it means to be a twin flame. And there are only two relationships that I can think of in Degrassi history that give us things or elements that are remotely close to the twin flame experience. But what a twin flame is, is we all come into this lifetime with a unique soul vibration that is uniquely ours. Let's say it was a code and we all have a particular number code that is our number. It, within our own vibration, within our own soul code, we have a masculine projection and a feminine projection of that same soul vibration. Those projections are what is known as twin flames. So it is the same soul but with a masculine projection and a feminine projection. So arguably, everyone has a twin flame, right? We all have a divine opposite. Whether you resonate as the masculine or the feminine, there is an opposite of you. Everyone's twin flame doesn't reincarnate at the same time that they do. And most people don't meet their twin flame because it is such a high vibrational relationship that it is very it's very challenging it's very tumultuous and it's designed for each person to elevate to their highest spiritual level with or without each other right but what happens in these relationships is typically the flames meet they have this initial um love bubble phase where everything is perfect and then the masculine typically runs away from the connection and then they sort of go back and forth in this runner chaser dynamic while each side is working to stabilize their own energy as individuals. Um, the most important part about the twin flame journey is to try not to focus as much of your energy on the physical individual and focus your energy on your own personal growth. It's when you do that that it is said that twin flames can individually grow and then come together in a harmonious union. So with that information, the only relationships that sort of mirror some of these dynamics is the relationship between Sean and Emma and the relationship between JT and Liberty. Sean and Emma definitely demonstrate that first love bubble phase where they both sort of fall for each other and everything is all good until it's not. Whereas JT and Liberty don't really have that phase, but JT and Liberty have the runner chaser dynamic and they also have a dynamic of mirroring each other's energy. For example, 
As much energy as Liberty put into being smart and being recognized for her intellect, JT put that same energy into being funny and to being liked for being entertaining. They both sort of came into things with the same level of energy and at the same vibration, but two different projections. Whereas Liberty really internalized her environment and JT externalized his environment and projected. And so the two of them go through the very classic runner chaser dynamic where JT is the masculine who doesn't want any parts of this connection, who doesn't acknowledge Liberty's value. And it's mostly just a mirror image of him not seeing his own value outside of who he's told himself that he is within his ego's perspective, right? JT is funny and he's the guy who's going to be liked by all the popular people because he just makes everyone laugh. And that means a lot to him. That is who he is. And that guy um, doesn't have a lot of acceptance for things about himself that he deems as uncool or as the opposite of this caricature that he's made himself to be. And the truth of himself is always seen clearest when he's faced with any conflict with Liberty because Liberty is a mirror for JT. She highlights for him all of the ways that he falls short and all of the ways that he tries to act inauthentically. When the two of them are both individually in authentic places, that's when we see the two of them come together and their relationship is super intense. They become like the power couple at school. Like nobody was messing with JT and Liberty. They were a true power dynamic. And then they ended up having a child in high school and they were both challenged by this situation. Liberty was challenged in her femininity and JT was challenged in his masculinity. How was he going to provide for Liberty and this child? And Liberty had to make the right, safest, most nurturing choice for that child, despite even what her own masculine counterpart might have wanted, which ended up leading to their separation. And one of the most important things to note about a twin flame connection is the feeling of being at home with one another. We see this towards the end of JT's life where he's reconciling with Toby about his relationship with Mia, where he's realizing that he's sort of projecting, he's saying this without saying it, that he sort of projected all of the things he couldn't do for Liberty into his relationship with Mia, but ultimately he wanted to go home to Liberty and he was ready to go home. Liberty was never not gonna be about JT. Even when they broke up, it was gonna be JT for Liberty or no one. And she was ready to accept him to come back home, but only if he was gonna be real, only if he was gonna be authentic and he wasn't gonna stand there and lie to her face and try to act like he still didn't have feelings for her. Unfortunately, we didn't get to see their harmonious union because JT ended up losing his life, but they are probably the most twin flamey. When we get to Sean and Emma, they had a back and forth dynamic because their relationship was good until it wasn't, until Sean got into that fight and ended up pushing Emma when he was trying to fight the other, I wanna say it was Jimmy that he was trying to fight and ended up hurting Emma in the process. And so their runner chaser dynamic was sort of twin flamey in that he tried to get Emma back, Emma pushed him away, Emma tried to get him back, he was with the other girl, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. But their biggest twin flame element is the concept of home when it comes to the two of them. Like when Sean felt like his home was at Emma's house, that was really him saying that Emma was his home. When Sean came back from living with his family, he didn't go back to Ellie because he wanted to go home and Emma was his home. And you could always see the two of them trying to make their relationship work, but if they hadn't done the personal work on their own, they couldn't maintain the vibration. They couldn't maintain the union if they didn't do the work on their own. So ultimately they end up separating and we think they're separated for the long haul, right? We see Emma marry Spinner and we see Sean go off into the military. But I promise you, this is one of the relationships where you could see Emma eventually growing and outgrowing her relationship with Spinner and divorcing him and then ending up back together with Sean. That's how much it gives very much twin flame. So 
This finally concludes our Degrassi Soul Connections Couples Relationships list. Please let me know what you thought about these videos in the comments if you managed to get through all three. Thank you again for watching and I will see you all in the next podcast episode, Breakdown or Reading.